Empire. Hello and welcome to my podcast. Do me a favor, subscribe to the John Conn Report wherever you get your podcast. You're watching on YouTube, hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button. You can find us there as part of Empire Media. That's A-M-P, I-R-E. And don't forget, Bram Weinstein, the voice of the commanders, and we'll talk to you in one minute. He and I will have our live YouTube stream show on Tuesday night at 7.30. It is not a Therapy Tuesday. How about that? Anyway, but there's still a lot to talk about, so join us for that um, for that episode, 7.30 p.m. Tuesday. Now, I am joined by the voice of the commanders, Bram Weinstein. Bram, let's get right to it. On Friday morning, I think it was, I told you, I'm thinking about picking these guys. And I didn't, so I can't take credit for it. But I was close, and that doesn't mean anything. I think a lot of it was the, the way the Packers were playing, but I didn't trust how this team was playing. What was different today? I swear, I thought you were throwing me under the bus because you were like, because <laughs> we talked no, no, about no. it on Friday, are you picking them? And I'm like, I don't know, you know, like, this, I this thought about a, it, you know. I thought about it, but I didn't. So I can't it's, take, I'm not taking credit, but I, because I didn't trust them just yet. What was different? Yeah, and also like this totally stunk of a get right game for Green Bay. You know, Rodgers is getting killed over offensive inefficiency and all this stuff. And I think we all know, like eventually he writes it, but it did not happen today. And uh, I mean, honestly, I can't say enough about the defense. Um, oh, man. You know, Green Bay came in here. It's very unusual that four players are playing different positions on an offensive line in a single week, but that's what happened today. Right. Uh, with Bakhtiari out, they moved uh, Jenkins, then they brought in the backup tackle and put him to the right, and then the guards were shifted around, and that was a mess. I mean, like, that would be – that that's a mess. And we knew going in, the one thing that's really off about them is they just don't have a downfield passing game. And on the very few attempts that yeah, they made well. doing it – it the timing is off. The receivers at points were running what looked like wrong routes. You could just see the frustration on Rodgers. And so they've been kind of relegated to being a run team and an underneath team. And he probably doesn't trust his line to protect him very long, especially against this front. And it showed because the ball's out of his hands immediately. And back. defensively, you know, Jack Del Rio and company were totally ready for it. What did he have? 190 yards passing, and most of it like what 40, 50 of it came on that oh. last drive right. you know, so, they had they right. they had 232 total yards over six on third downs now there were two third down pickups by penalty on that on yeah. that one series and then rogers threw for 194 yards and like you said there was a lot on that last in that last sequence so they did their job i mean look at the rushing I and mean, here's the rushing attempts too 38 yards rushing on 12 attempts 3.2 per that's why this defense is bad this defense has really jumped up not it's not just this game. We've talked about this, but they have been playing better for about four or five weeks. They just kept giving up big plays, and there were a couple that were close to being made today, but they didn't happen. So um, that's one of the reasons why they've been playing well. And you talk about the defensive line, and even you know they weren't getting the sacks. But when you're pressuring, that's what you need. If you're forcing the ball to come out fast, that's what you need. They weren't going to get any sacks because he's getting the ball out of his hands. I mean, right, right. Like, like a, he was playing to, I don't think I can either be protected or I don't, we can't run a slow developing play anyway because I don't trust my receivers, whatever it may be. And, well, I could just hear my boy Zabe freaking out about 12 carries if that's what the number was tomorrow well, up at Milwaukee radio. Uh, <laughs> because, like, frankly, like right now, and this is Packers problems, but like they should be running the ball more. I mean, that, that's not even in question understand. that they should be running the ball more. And they didn't today. And I don't know, like off the last it, couple of weeks, time. Washington's give up a lot of rush yards. I, albeit oddly, it's just the fields had a lot of rush yards, mainly on scrambles. It wasn't really yeah. runs. Yeah. And there was one bad defensive play that skewed the stats with Herbert having that 64 right. yard run. Oh, and then with, with you know, Henry had a hundred yard game on them, but like he did it on almost 30 carries. Right. So it like wasn't a bad number, but like I know they pay this guy fifty million dollars, but the object's to win, and their best attribute is running the ball, and it's not even close right now. And so I'd like to say thank you to them for playing right into this team's hands, but I don't want to take anything away from the Washington defense, which has been very, very, very good for a month going now. Absolutely. And, you know, part of it, too, and talking to guys in the locker room, one of the things that you forget about this defense is they did change up. It's the same staff. It's the same guys. But they did change up a lot of what they're asking to do in terms of coverage. And it's more of a zone match. So there's more. It's not just simple. OK, we're changing this. Let's go do this. 
you do have to change, learn how you have to play that. You have to learn where you have to be, how you have to handle that, et cetera. So I do think there was some transition there for them. Another key, I think you look at that again, and then I look in the secondary. Another key is I think without William Jackson the third, it's a better secondary. I think Rashad Wild Goose, believe it or not, I think has done a decent job in the slot, not not just from the coverage, but the communication aspect. I think he and St. Juice do a better job than it when it was with Jackson because Jackson too often would be confused. And it's not a miscommunication if five guys and four guys in the secondary know what they're supposed to do and one guy doesn't. That's a botch. So that's what was happening. And I think they've taken away some of that because of some of those, because of that move. I think that's, that's a part of it. Um, yes. Um, you know, I, it's hard to make this argument because that was Aaron Rodgers today that they faced, but like, frankly, the downfield passing game of the last few opponents really last four was not significant. Like that's not right. the threat like Dallas with Cooper rush is true. very different than I think what Dallas with Dak could be down the field. Um, Tennessee, has no downfield passing game whatsoever. That's, that's and in fact, true. in fact, don't even really attempt very much of it. They they're all play action. Everything's underneath. It's all misdirection, and and it it's centered around Derrick Henry. But you're not seeing um, the big bust like you did. That's right. With, you know, so that's correct. And then with you know with Chicago, you know, frankly, that's a one read quarterback, and they don't have serious downfield threats anyway. And then today, like, well, Green Bay should be this way, and I think that's what's probably frustrating for them. But it's just not there, and it's been that way the whole season, but, like. His like Rogers completion percentage down the field is like 22%. It's bottom third in metrics. Like they're just not clicking that way. And the way we talk about how roster construction with guard and potentially corner and stuff like that could have gotten in the way to the slow start. Trust me in green Bay, they're screaming and yelling at the GM going, you let Devonte Adams go. You let Valdez Scantley go. You replace them with nobody that was reliable and look at what the result is. And I don't care that he's this all world quarterback. You got to give him some help. Absolutely. And, and what I'm talking about with the secondary, it's not just the downfield stuff. It's just about knowing your assignment. I think that there are there are plays that have happened, even in the Chicago game, there were some times where there'd be a motion to a bunch formation and the way Wild Goose and, and St. Juice would communicate was just better than it had been. And it, it, yeah. it prevents some of those situations. It's not even just about the big play. It's about you know, I'm not, they're, they're not, I'm not going to make this into some all world secondary, but I do think that's a, one of those little detail, little improvements that I think has helped. Yeah. It really, it, this really starts with the defensive front. Well, I mean, they gave up seven points last week, albeit, you know, it took three stops inside the five to hold them to seven, but they did. Uh, Green Bay only scored two offensive touchdowns today. You'll take that any day of the week, right? Against them. You'll, you'll take that. Um, Tennessee scored 21, but it was hard to get around to that number. Like, it's not easy to score on these guys. And so, I, like, again, I don't want to take anything away from them. They've gotten better and better and better. I think you were standing there when we were talking to Bobby McCain, and he kind of reiterated the things that Rivera and Jack Del Rio said in the summer, that everybody showing up in the spring got them more on the same page. That doesn't loop in people like Wild Goose, who showed up at the end of camp sure. after they made some decisions, but they're getting validated with some of these. I mean, this guy, Wild Goose, is, like, to your point, like, he's played a lot. He's been put in positions. I thought the first, you know, basically week that he was forced to play against Philadelphia was a really unfair position for him. He had been here very long, got caught a couple of times. And I'm like, that's a reflection of decisions by the, the coaches like GM Ron got in coach Ron's way by putting somebody out there that maybe wasn't ready to take on an offense as dynamic as that. But he's gotten better and better and better. And I agree. There's, the big plays aren't happening and they just totally stifled Aaron Rodgers today. And so then that's worth something. I want to get to the offense in a minute. But I do want to stay here just a little bit with the defense, too. What have you thought of the linebacker play lately, too? I Outstanding. Mean, it, yeah, I mean, they. I think. Outstanding. And one, and one of the things before I before you go on there, one of the things that you'd hear from, like, when you talk to people here is the community. Again, communication is so huge in this in this business, in this on the field. Now that I think one thing that's helped is having Cam Curl back out there in those when he's up in that Buffalo nickel role his ability to communicate with 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 uh, Cole Holcomb, I think, is a big deal. So, like, they know what each other's going to do just by – because they play together a little bit. They're both smart players. They both study the hell out of the film. And then I also think the communication with Davis and, and Holcomb is good. In fact, there have been times – and I, I'm not going to make – again, I don't want to go overboard on stuff, but the defense is playing better. So, like, there are times where they've been pleased because they see Davis relaying something to Holcomb – and they feel like it's not just some one-sided effort here that they feel like Davis is starting to get it as well. Holcomb's been an animal, 
for about three weeks running here. Um, he keeps going like this. He's going to challenge to be uh, like a leader in tackles in the NFL. Like if, if that continues this way, he's been outstanding. Um, read, react, moving fast. Um, Davis, I still think like the limitations are out in coverage where he's reacting yeah. to something. He can get caught in, in, a, in a matchup. But when he's just going and he's just going a lot more, you see what the athleticism is. Mm -hmm. He has a missile. Like he had two tackles for loss here. You know, the one that really stood out earlier this year was the Eagles game where Jalen Hurts, he couldn't get to the edge because Davis was getting there so fast. So things are coming along for them. And listen, that position looked like a massive liability. And I still think, not unlike corner, they're a rolled ankle here or there from being yeah, at a they really don't have spot. Any they just have no depth. Um, but if those two can stay healthy, I think they've answered a lot of questions. And again, have validated the coaches a little bit in trusting them because we thought all along they'd bring someone else you know, viable almost starter to come in and either play for one or the other. And they didn't do that. And I thought it was a risk. And early in the season, it looked like a risk that was a mistake. And now over the last four or five weeks, it certainly doesn't feel that way. They've both been very, very good. Yeah. And again, the key here with everything is consistency. Your kickers lining up for an onside kick and the chances of regaining possession are slim. Stakes are high tension is higher your pulse racing he kicks and you watch the ball land make every play feel this exciting with DraftKings Sportsbook an official sports betting partner of the NFL and their unbeatable offers right now new customers can make any $5 NFL bet and get $200 in free bets if your team wins Check this out. In addition to the usual bets, everyone can boost their winnings with DraftKings stepped up same game parlays. To make things even sweeter, you can throw down on stepped up same game parlays once per game day all season long. So download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use promo code KIME, K-E-I-M, to get $200 in free bets if your team wins. Just place a $5 bet on any football game only at DraftKings Sportsbook using code KIME. Minimum age and eligibility restrictions apply. See show notes for details. Let's flip to the offensive side and then Taylor Heineke and, and, and the offense. But look, we'll start with Taylor because he comes in for Carson Wentz. And for people who you haven't heard, Wentz is going to be on IR, so he's going to miss the next three games as well with that fractured finger. But Taylor comes in, and we've seen him before. He looks a lot. He looks the same. Somehow he does it. Somehow he does it, Bram. <laughs> Somehow. I uh I love the mentality that the kid has. Love it. This is a hard position to be in because I love him. I really do. I just I like the way he plays. Um, I just I I understand there's limitations. Like I I see them too. Like he doesn't have the the downfield arm that someone like Wentz has. Um, but I think you know culturally here with this organization. Um, we like underdogs here. We like blue collar players here. Like we don't need a superstar. I'm we gladly take Pat Mahomes or Josh Allen if we ever got that person here. But short of that, like these people are attractive to us, like as longtime fans. And I think I'm speaking for a lot of people, and I think everybody knows what I'm talking about. And this guy just plays hard. He puts his body on the line, he's a gamer, he makes a mistake, he doesn't get down. These dudes rally around him. It is like so obvious they rally around him. And it's not a comparison to Wentz or how they played around Wentz. It isn't. And that's why this is a tough thing to talk about. Like, you know, because I've talked to you privately a lot about it. I love this dude. I just like the way he plays. Like, uh, will I agree with the organization that they don't feel like they can get enough out of him 17 times to get where they want to get to? I don't know. But you, for my money on this team, if you got to play one game and you got to get a win. I want the ball in this guy's hands. I like his moxie. I like the way he plays. I just love him. I like everything about him. And I'm glad he's on this team right now because he might save their season the way it was going. And I don't know what this means in three, four weeks. And I don't want to project out because I don't know how they're going to play in Indianapolis right. or against Minnesota or right. against Philadelphia. Like they lose the next three. They'll either go back to Wentz or turn to Hal. But if he gets them on a run, it's going to be because of the way he plays for sure. And if that's the case, then I hope they have a tough decision to make when the time comes. And the thing that the thing that I've always liked about him, and I tweeted this out, is that he can make 
some really bad mistakes. That pick six was bad, <clears throat> you know, and there, so had he, four picks in the first half, like bad throws. Yeah. I mean, really bad throws. And just, and sometimes there were sometimes like he has to be able to step into his throw. So one of those throws that like McLaurin over the middle, I think it was where he couldn't put anything on it. It's because Norwell's given up pressure and 97 is right. Frank Clark is like right in his face. So he can't step into it. He doesn't have the arm to overcome that. Not many do. So he needs everything to go right. He needs to be able to step into those throws. He needs to, he has to get his feet around to make all that. But what I always like have liked about him and admired about him is, is that he's a competitor. And so when things go bad, how do guys respond? And he throws a pick six and, they, and he still comes back and throws a touchdown pass to Antonio Gibson on third down. That was huge. And then he drops a dime to McLaurin down the sidelines. And then that, from that point, on, I was like, they're, they're going to win this game. Somehow they're going to win this game. But it's because of that kind of mentality. And I do think it permeates throughout the team. Now, there's the flip side because they know that when it, it can look really, really ugly at times with him. Of course. And I think what they're learning, though, is that if you can keep them in the game, that this kid will find a way to maybe get them back, to help get them back in it. Not just by making plays on his own. He's not good enough to make those plays on his own. He's a backup for a reason. But, you know, if you can stick with the game plan, you get the run game going, and you make a couple big plays, then you then you can then he can get you back in. He's not a top tier talent. Like I I understand. No. I get it. Like I totally I totally totally understand he's a that. Backup, and that's fine. But he's he a, he's is. A but I, you like there's something about him. Like he just yeah. the fan base really likes him, and I think for good reason. The team really likes him. It's funny if you just go ask, go ask his teammates about him. They light up when they talk. Oh, they about really him. like him. They like him. Like they just like it. And this is not a comparison to Wentz because it is because I don't think they it's not they dislike Wentz and they like him. That's not what it is at all. But like this guy relates to them in a way that's obvious. They like the way he plays. They like like his everything that we see and kind of feel just from afar looking in. They say it like you can see their eyes light up when they talk about this guy. They just they're rooting for him. Like you can feel that like they're rooting for him. The other one today is. Like, look, like their best offensive weapon at times should be Terry McLaurin. Like, I, I understand they have a lot of weapons on this team and there's one ball and they got to find, you know, the ball needs to go to certain places. Well, Heineke targets this dude. And when the game was on the line, he targeted this guy and he's asking him to make plays on behalf of the team. That's the way it ought to be. The ball needs to go to 17, especially with the game on the line. It's why you paid him $72 million. It's what he's done for three plus years with 8,000 quarterbacks. This guy is a gamer too. And so this was a great development that one, Scott Turner didn't just run the ball three times and just eat the clock or whatever and put it back. Is what I thought said, they All right. Did. Like looked at the formation and said, okay, take a shot. Um, Heineke on both passes, one of them, McLaurin just made a tremendous play after the catch. And on the second one, that was not a good throw. And McLaurin is the one who adjusted back to make the catch and really keep the drive going. And like, this is you want, and this, you know what? Heineke trusts him that way. And that's the way it ought to be with the game of the line. The ball needs to go to your best players. Terry also broke up a pass early in the game that on that first series that could have led to easy Packer points. Um, when I think he threw, he threw it to Cam. I think he was throwing it to Cam Sims, but Terry came over and basically breaks up the play. I want to get back to that play in a second because I have some stuff on Terry about that play that is good. But going back to Heineke and the popularity in the locker room, he is a guy that when we're in the locker room during the open media sessions, he is in there almost the entire time. Just he's hanging out with the other some of the guys in his little corner. It's the it's Sam Howell's over there, Alex Erickson's over there, the running backs are in that area. Wentz's locker is right next to his, and Wentz comes in and out. But Heineke is a presence in the locker room. Now, he's not out there running around, running his mouth and this big guy, but he's in there with the guys. And, like, they used to have – they still have this putting machine that for the first couple of weeks, he'd always be doing the putting machine with with some other guys who come around too. So he's a guy, but he but people do like him. And for whatever that's worth, they but they they gravitate to his story as well. And when it goes well, I think they really like it for him. Now – Again, he's limited. We know he's, again, high-end backup, low-end starter, fine. But his story does resonate. And and when they win, you know, he usually finds a way to help. Going back to the other stuff, too, what I also like, Bram, Brian Robinson, 20 carries, 73 yards, Gibson, 10 for 59. Yeah. I think that's very reflective of who those guys are. Robinson, the grinded-out guy, Gibson with a little more explosiveness. 
this is the this that running those numbers are exactly what they probably have said if you could drop a perfect scenario for them with the running game today would be one of those days because it showed the power of Robinson and the and the explosiveness or yeah. you know Gibson with the big runs outside yes uh, like in space you want Gibson in space he can run between the tackles he's not as good as someone like Robinson in between the tackles in space he can be devastating and he also made three catches and had a touchdown because he's a nightmare matchup for anybody a linebacker or corner whoever's going to try to try to cover him like he makes one guy miss he's gone like he's got four 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 speed four three speed like I I think they're figuring themselves out you know I think we've been saying this for a while but you know, it's funny with Heineke going back in like all of a sudden, all the things that we thought they would start to implement a rush offense that has a dynamic duo, one yeah. that's more of a traditional between the tackles and another guy who could be, you know, lack of a better way of putting it, the thunder and lightning part of the whole thing. They're figuring that part out. I do think that, especially with Heineke under center, they feel more comfortable calling a lot more run plays if the game dictates that they can. I don't think they want him throwing the ball all over the place. That said, like I will go back to at the end of the game where they very easily could have gotten extremely conservative and run the ball a few times, or even in this one where I think might've been a mistake at the end, you know, on the driver, they kicked the field goal to go up by nine. Like they did have him throw the ball like yeah. inside the five. Like they didn't just try to pound it in, which would have been the more conservative and considering Robinson's, you know, success rate, probably the best way to go now. And they didn't, they like, they trusted Heineke to make plays when he had to. And so I like that, but like, this feels a little, you know, maybe the, the balance is, this is what we want to be, but it doesn't mean we're going to shackle our quarterback. You know, like he can make plays. He is mobile more in the second half. You saw them roll him out a little bit, design some stuff, show off his mobility, allow that to be a, a you know, a part of the offense. And the other thing I noticed a lot of, there was a heck of a lot more motion today than there has been in recent weeks. Curtis Samuel was moving a lot. He was lining up at different spots. Just watch, Just go rewatch any game where they use a lot of motion with him. Two, three people follow him wherever he goes. Like he is a linchpin for their offense. And I thought that disappeared for a little bit. Who, who, regardless I don't think it disappeared order, that much, do you? Nice I don't fun. think it disappeared that much. You think so? I like to have him back. It is. Now, the other thing, go, I want to go back to Gibson for a minute too, though, because I'm looking at this. <clears throat> Again, 10 carries, 59 yards, three catches, 18, plus a nine-yard touchdown catch. Nice, nice route, nice catch in the back of the end zone. Three kickoff returns, 78 yards. So he had 150, if my math is right, so if it's not, please correct me, 155 total yards yeah. today, which is really good. And again, I think if you said, how's the ideal way to use them? Today was a good way. I'm sure that is a way that they would envision as, as one what they they really like, what they got from him. And I and I like I like how they were getting him on the outside. They did a good job at times creating numbers for him. But think about it too, Bram. They scored 23 points. They had no Logan Thomas, no Jahan Dotson. They lost a tight end during the game, and Colterno went out with a concussion. They're playing Armani Rogers, who ends up making a couple of plays. He has three catches for 28 yards. You know, you, your your line your line was in better shape than Green Bay's, but like it wasn't like they had all this all their weapons available today. They were missing guys, and they still somehow made it work. But it, it really it really does start with that run game for them. They've got this has to be their identity. It, it cannot be anything else. Because this is where, you know, they this is a team that needs to minimize a lot of its mistakes, and that's a way for them to do it. Yep. You so, know, I think, uh, and I think this is, listen, you know, I want to be fair to all the coaches too. Like, I know they've worked with Heineke for a year, but this is kind of a different offense with a different package with Robinson and Samuel yeah, now in yeah. it, different linemen. I want to be fair to them to like, let them feel this out for a couple of weeks too. And it took them about, took them a half. And I mean, and it, frankly, like, as much as I'm praising Heineke for the comeback and everything, he wasn't very good in the first oh, half. Oh, like, no, he was, he was not. It wasn't very good. He was bad. He was wildly bad. inaccurate. Could yeah. have had a number of interceptions. Did it have one bad. go back. They're very lucky that the fumble didn't go in for a touchdown too, because there was a penalty down yeah. the field. So, you know, he didn't, he wasn't, he wasn't good in the first half, you know, no, like not at in all. the second half things came around. And, you know, it's funny. They always talk about the Wentz roller coaster. Boy, you get it with him too. Oh, big Except time. that for some reason, he seems to be sitting in these one score games that you feel like they might win at the end of the game. Yeah, and he, I don't know like, what that is, but it's like his aura. Or others something. here will say, like, there's he's got that little horseshoe in his back pocket. Yeah, he and, does. And, and I think I think that's there's he he throws some balls up for grabs, like the one to Terry's like uh, where it's Terry over there. I'm just gonna throw it. But I did want to go back to that play for a reason because we were talking to Terry about that after the game, and there's two things with that. One, 
he was talking about how much it means to him to be the guy that they look for in those situations. He said guys are coming up to him on the sidelines and saying, 17, you got to get one. You got to make a play for us. And when you do that to a guy like that who came in as a third-round pick, who was not a superstar receiver in college, who was a guy that they thought would be a special teams guy, and even though he got that big contract, he still always feels like he's fighting for that sort of eleva- elevated standing. And so I think it yeah. means a ton to him to do that. And then, so th- he talked a lot about that, but then also I asked him on that last play, on that play that won the third down catch, like what goes through your mind when you see the ball coming? And one of the things he talked about was earlier in his career, he felt like he didn't always attack the ball enough, didn't always come back for the ball aggressively enough. And, I'm, and but this is a guy, and this is one, one of the things I respect the most about him is he works on his game as much as anybody. And he knows what his weaknesses are and what he can try and do to correct those. And so he has worked and made it a point of emphasis to play those balls better. And that resulted in that play, because if he doesn't aggressively attack that ball, it may be picked or it's certainly an incompletion. I I just, I thought that the end of the game, those two catches, both of them, one, the one he made, you know, that was an easy pitch and catch, but stayed in bounds by using a stiff arm on Jair Alexander. Yeah. Great play. That last one, too, was his – that was his best play. It was one of the best ones he's had since he's been here. I mean, they needed to win. Heideke's throw was nowhere near him, really, frankly. He saw it's this, came back for the ball, made the catch. Like, this is what we need for him. It's why you pay him this kind of money, because he can be this kind of player for you. Um, last year, there were a couple times Heineke just, you know, at t- like the Atlanta game. I remember the Atlanta game. Just chucked one up to him in the back of the end zone. He was, like, double-covered. And he made this catch because he trusts him. Yeah, He's like, this is our way. number one receiver. Sometimes you just, and when, when it comes down to it, you ask your best players to make a big play. And they did here. That's what Heineke has done here. And so I, I appreciate that. And, and I'm glad that, you know, I saw, and I feel like for him, this is what he should be here too. It's funny, like earlier this year, he was getting tugged and pulled and never getting any calls. And I remember we were talking about like, He's not being treated like a number one receiver. Like the referees don't treat him that way. Like he hasn't been elevated that way, but he is. And the more plays he does like this, he'll get more and more and more respect throughout the league at literally every level. I would say they have heard back quite a bit from the league that, oh yeah, you are right about that. That should have been a pass interference, including that one in Dallas. The league did, the league apologized. So I'm sure everybody feels good about that. Um, but but one thing that it's funny that you say that too, because like one of the things that, that Heineke did say it's like, you know, well, you got Terry one-on-one. I figure they're paying this guy a lot of money, so I'm going to give him a chance. Yeah. And it's right. Last thing. Um, is this a two-game streak start, or do you feel – do you still need to see a lot more before you say, hey, I think they can make some noise here? Uh, man, I need to see a lot more, I think. Like, I'm at the point where I trust that their defense will show up weekly and put up a pretty good performance, and asking them to – stifle everybody every week i think it's a big ask but they are uh productive enough and consistent enough that i think that i have a reasonable expectation that they'll be good if not great on certain weeks and you know indianapolis had a weird i gotta watch them because i haven't really watched a lot of them but they've been very up and down here like one week they're getting shut out and the next week ryan's got 450 and a loss or a close win and then today apparently they couldn't score any points i have to kind of look at their offense and see what's going on there um but this is another big one. I mean, four and four is way different than three and five when you kind of turn the corner for the second half of the season and then they're coming back home. So this is a big one this weekend. And it's hard for me to it's hard for me to judge Indianapolis yet. I mean, I've seen a little bit of them because they we had some common opponents. So I've seen a little bit of them, but I was really watching the opponent, not them that much. So I don't know where they are. It sounds like offensively they're kind of all over the map. But if that's the case, I like our chances, at least defensively, to, you know have another type of performance like we've had the last few weeks? There may be some people in this organization who would like to see them beat the Colts and Jim Irsay in particular. <laughs> yeah. I'm just like Scott Jackson on our post game show today. We were driving home. He's like, you know, we lost that Wentz storyline going into Indianapolis. He goes, if only we could come up with another hook for this game. <laughs> <laughs> but that's like, that goes back, you know, that goes back to the other sell the team stuff though. This was a, another difficult week for the organization. Just be, yeah. I mean, of stuff of their own doing, we get it. But like when Ursay comes out and says what he does, and not nobody, it's a win. So I we don't need to get in all that. But 
the players have to deal with that. And Terry McLaurin will talk about, he sits there and answers a couple of questions about it. It's not like it's a huge distraction, but they are aware of what's said and what's going on. And, you know, so like, it doesn't even mean like if all you have to do is turn on sports center and there's Jim Mercy talking about your team or your owner. And so I think, you know, when you can go through that, it, that stuff can wear you out. So when you can get a win in a week like sure. that, I think it can really pick you up. You know, and, I think the players, the players and coaches say this a lot. And we always think like, oh, they're just saying that like, but on Sundays between one and four, it really, it shouldn't matter. And like when I'm calling the game between one and four, I'm not thinking about that stuff. No. And I don't really, I don't care. No, you just want to watch the game. And, you know, again, like and for Taylor Heineke, like he, he could, I mean, this is this month might be the difference between him getting some contract, whether here or somewhere else next year and having an elongated NFL career or not, you know, like, so he can't be caught up in what Jim Ursay said at an owner's meeting. Like, what does he care? You know, like, so, right, right. you know, I think like the, listen, it's hard. I, I like, and it's, it's the type of stuff that you would hope when you're with the team, like you're not dealing with, because it's just another thing. It's just a distraction really more than anything. But it really does. I firmly believe this. It's nothing to do with what happens on the field on Sundays. And I I think you saw that today. Like they could have acted like a team that was under some kind of duress from social media or what the other owners may think, but they didn't. No. And, you know, last thing on this, too, and then we'll wrap it up right there. But this this win means a lot to Heineke because he cashes in one hundred twenty five thousand dollars for every win that's in his contract. And I got a story up on ESPN.com about that right now and what he likes to buy when he gets those W's. So he's got incentive to win games regardless of what's going on. So what's in your contract when they win? What do you get? I I, I, I get a reprieve. That's what I get. You know, you get, you get like, for us, we get a week where it's like, you don't have to ask about all the nonsense going on. So, you know, anyway, whatever. So let's wrap it up there, Bram. Uh, Bram, thanks for joining me, and thanks to everybody for tuning in. As always, you can listen to Bram and I on Tuesday night, 7.30, YouTube live stream. Join us there. Bring your questions, and if you still have some rants or some questions or problems, you can bring those, too, because there's still only three and four, and there's a long, long way to go. Have you seen enough to say, hey, maybe they can inch their way back into some sort of playoff contention here in a legitimate fashion. So bring all that Tuesday night, 7.30 Eastern time on YouTube, and we will talk to you next time.